Hello and welcome to today's live stream closing event for SARS 2021 webinar series on DMA and DSA. As most of you know, our independent think tank has been closely following and thinking about the future of digital markets and digital services regulations for quite some time. We also came up last year with a series of very concrete proposals, which clearly have been taken into account by the Commission, as one can see among others, if you read the bibliography of the impact assessment document, which the Commission published along its proposals. The reason for SARS involvement is not only linked to the series of issues raised by the development of the online platform economy. It also, because these issues go to the heart of a key question for Europe. And that question is, how can the EU regulate to stay globally competitive and keep pace with the rapid dynamism that's a signature feature for the digital transition? SER has also paid particular attention to the Commission proposals of last December and came up with an assessment, a set of recommendations, paper on these in January of this year. Then the SER rendezvous sessions held in January, March, 2021, looked at the key pillar components of the Commission package, architecture, prohibitions, obligations, institutional design, enforcement, and of course, the, the DSA. This afternoon, to wrap up this uh, rendezvous series of valuable debates, we're proposing what I think is quite an exciting program. Let me remind you first that, as usual, throughout the various sessions, viewers will have the possibility to ask questions via Slido using the hashtag SERDMA or via the QR code which appears on your screen right now. So what's the menu for this afternoon? In about 15 minutes, I will interview Andrea Schwab, the German MEP who's the rapporteur of the DMA proposal. Then we'll have a high level panel with Dr. Christina Capara and Professor Harry First. They will discuss global and US perspectives on digital regulation. And then my SER colleague, Alexandre Strel, will share his takeaways from the discussions and try to identify in particular what may come next. But to start, I'm very pleased to welcome Cédric O, French Secretary d'État and English Minister of State for the Digital Transition and Electronic Communications. Thank you, Minister, for, for joining us this afternoon. And uh, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me today on those so important topics. Thank you. France's role in, in the DMA and the DSA dossier is, is particularly important since your country will hold the presidency of the Council of Ministers in the first half of next year. That is precisely when the trilogue discussions with the Parliament and the Commission are, at least at this stage, planned to be concluded. So, Minister, the first question I'll put to you is what are your views on, on the DMA proposal? And if I may, if you've had, had the chance to look at the SARE recommendations of January 21, what are your reactions of them? Well, um, thank you for having me today. I, I think that, that the discussion is both uh, topical, but also very important. Uh, by the way, both from a, an economic, but also from a democratic point of view. And I do believe uh, that, that uh, the, the DMA might be one of the most important texts uh, that Europe has been adopted and, and, and one of the most important texts in the history of economic regulations uh, for the past decades. Um, well, I think that everybody is, is sharing the, the, same, uh, uh, the same feelings. We have seen uh, some new players emerge, some new uh, stakeholder emerge. Um, which uh, which footprint on our economy and on our democracy is too big and too complex. Um, so this is why we need, to some extent, um, an update of uh, our regulation tools, because the, the tools that uh, the Commission is relying on so far, which have uh, obviously a, a lot of efficiency, um, might not be enough to catch uh, the complexity and, and the business model that is based on, on data of those players, um, which footprint I, I mentioned is, is, really, uh, is really huge. I, I think that there are two things that are really important within the commission proposals. Uh, uh, the, the first one is the 
asymmetrical approach. Uh, we, we have to, to assume the fact that uh, the questions that are raised by big techs are not the same that we are used to solve or we are used to tackle, uh, we've been used to tackle over the past years. Uh, as far as antitrust is concerned. So, so we do think, and this is a point on which the French is really insisting, and we, we from a, a general point of view, are really backing the Commission's proposal, but, but uh, we, we do think that we should remain uh, with, a, with a limited number of players because those players have specific, specificities that, that we need to tackle. The, the second issue um, that, that have been discussed and, and uh, on which uh, I do think that this is the real new thing within the, the commission's proposal is the ex ante regulation. Uh, and, and we do think that we, we have to, not fully, but for part of the regulation to move from a, 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 a next post approach, uh, which is healing some damages caused by the, uh, by, by the specificities of the digital economy, to a supervision uh, uh, process, as, as we did uh, in some uh, domains, such as telecommunication, uh, water supply, and so on, uh, and so on, in which um, the, the economy is, by its sense, uh, has a trend, has a, by its sense, a mon monopoly or oligopoly trend, which is the case uh, in the in the digital uh, sector. I, I do think that those two points are really critical. Uh, and if we are able to adopt the Commission's proposals um, quite quickly, uh, and, and you mentioned that the Horizon, which is a French presidency with a trial dialogue mm -hmm. that we hope will happen uh, uh, at this Horizon, um, Europe might be, as it was uh, for the GDPR, uh, a real pioneer in the world as far as uh, antitrust regulation is, is concerned. If we, if, we, if we go perhaps deeper now into, into the some details of the proposals. For instance, the commission mentions uh, eight core platform services and criteria for, for gatekeeper designation. Do you think that this is, this is good enough or are they under-inclusive or over-inclusive? Have you got a view on that already, Mr. O? We've been, we've been discussing on that point. Uh, so far, we, we are pretty, pretty aligned with, with the commission's approach. Uh, I, I, first, I do think that the question is not, and I think this is important to underscore that, the question is not a question of, of nationality. And, and, and I think that if we want to, uh, for the, 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 the regulation to be efficient, we have to, to remind everybody that the, the question is not about uh, those platforms being American or, or European. We, we need to tackle a business model. The commission proposal is, is so far focusing on a limited number uh, of, of players, I, I remember that Margaret Vestager and Thierry Breton mentioned 10 to, to 15 uh, mm -hmm. uh, platforms. Um, I do think that this is the right scope uh, because for two reasons. First, and I mentioned it, the question is a business model and, a, and the fact that some of those platforms are, are creating a, a, an overwhelming environment that pose new problems. And the second one is, I do think if, if we broaden the scope too much, then we will enter into a lot of collateral discussion, let me put it like this, uh, that will uh, prevent us from, from tackling what we want to tackle. Are the, are the obligations uh, good enough? Should we, should we have other obligations? And, and you know, is, is this sufficiently flexible also? <laughs> I think you, you touch on one point, which is uh, which might be the, the most critical uh, issue uh, for the for the for the French government. And I, I had the opportunity last Monday to to discuss that uh, with Thierry Breton. Uh, today, the, the the DMA is mentioning a limited number of bans or uh, of problematic practices, uh, which is a good approach. But uh, we do think that. That economy and the business model and the the way those actors are uh, and those players are evolving is is, is changing so fast um, that we shall not be in a position uh, where a player is developing a new business model that is not banned by the the, the, the ban list um, and that we we need to adopt a new regulation and and that will take 
uh, a few years to do so. So what we think is that we have to adapt to, to the speediness of, uh, of evolution of that uh, digital economy, give to the regulator, and we, we want the regulator to be as European as possible. Uh, what we saw in the GDPR is that there might be, if when the national regulators are, are, in, uh, are implied, some differences that, that, that is uh, threatening the whole text itself. Uh, so we, we, we want uh, the, the regulation to be as European um, as possible, and we want to give the regulator a certain amount of leeway uh, that, that allows him and that uh, um, creates for him the, the ability to have a tailor-made approach if he wants to tackle uh, to tackle a practice or some uh, uh, business cases or some uh, uh, example that was not uh, um, forecasted within the within the list. You, you, Obviously, this is a, a legal issue because uh, because this is creating legal uncertainty, and and we have to circumvent that as much as possible. But we do think that if if we run if we we do we do not forecast the, the the future problems, then we will have solved the problem of yesterday and maybe not the problem of tomorrow. You, you, you touch upon the, the issue of regulator, uh, Minister. This is very much related to the issue of enforcement. To, we need a system which can be enforced. You mentioned GDPR and we see the limits of the, the enforcement of, uh, of GDPR. Uh, what do you think about the way the things are being proposed by, by the commission with, with that regard. I mean, is it good to have a, a centralized enforcement at the commission? You are now just, if I understand well, in front of your parliament with a new proposal for a new body, uh, ARCOM. Uh, do you think that national authorities should be more involved? And how you see the, I would say, the tension between a, a, central, a centralized enforcement and the necessary responsibilities that should be given to national authorities? Well, on that point, I think there are differences between the DSA and the DMA. Uh, we are obviously concerned by the way the DSA is, is designed uh, and, and uh, with the balance between country of origin and country of destination, because we think that, uh, uh, to put it in a nutshell, that won't work. Uh, the way it is designed. I, I don't think that, that this is possible that one country that is uh, um, uh, hosting the most of the international player will, uh, will hire sufficient, uh, a sufficient number of regulators of people, to, to put it like this, uh, to take into account uh, the regulation of all the European countries. So I, I, I do think that there is uh, an issue there that, might be, that, might be, uh, that, have to be, that has to be solved. Um, we don't want to get back on the country of origin principle, which is at the base uh, uh, of, of the basis of the of the single market. But we think that what we see in the, in the GDPR is the is, for instance, the fact that we need to be able of, the the European Union or the Commission has to be able to 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 give an arbitrage quite fast. Otherwise, the single market is not is not working. As far as the DMA is concerned. Um, we think that the approach of the Commission is the right one. Uh, I saw that there are discussions uh, coming from national regulators and, 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 uh, and uh, competition authorities in order to, to, to better balance the, the, the power of the Commission and the power of national authorities. As far as I am concerned, I do think that, uh, especially in the, in the antitrust uh, uh, area, the single market is, is a real issue. And if we want the, the market to be as single as possible, then the regulator has to be as European uh, as possible. Otherwise, if there are different assessments of the regulation by national authorities, and that always happens, uh, or if there are countries that, that wants to, to some extent, play uh, with the, the border of the regulation, then this will be threatening the, the single market. If we want to avoid that, and if we want also um, the regulator to have the power uh, to act against players that have the size of the state, I do think that again um, the, the the most uh, the, the European the, the regulator is the better this is. 
can, can let, let me just because we unfortunately we, we we just have three minutes left to go. Let me ask you: How do you see the work uh, going further in the council? Uh, do you think that uh, uh, there may be points on which the uh, the member states will want to improve the proposal? And and do you see already a number of uh, divergences and, and and convergences uh, in in the work going on so far? Well, I've been having discussion with uh, a lot of my uh, counterparts. Um, what struck me is, is a, the, the, the level of convergence. Uh, what, what we see is, is that there are differences of approach, uh, taking into account the, the cultural differences on the DSA, uh, which is a little bit trickier. Uh, but on the DMA, there is a, a real convergence. I had discussion with my German, my uh, Spanish, my Italian, uh, my Swedish counterparts. I, I co-signed uh, and add a paper with my uh, my Dutch counterpart, and and we see uh, that there is a growing consensus on the fact that we need economic regulation for innovation um, to protect uh, the right of European citizens, but also for democratic reasons because the questions that we see and the problem that we see within the democratic area that are tackled by the DSA are intimately linked with the footprint of those players and the economic issue. And as far as I'm concerned, I do believe that the first question is the economic one, uh, which is entailing all the, the other one. Uh, and, and, and so that's why I think that there might be some difference on detail. I mentioned the, 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 the list of ban practices, the balance between national and European authorities. Uh, I don't think that, that there is any um, deal breaker on, on those points, and I do think that we will be able to make uh, quick progress in the coming months. These are very encouraging words, and uh, we, we thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. Merci beaucoup. We, we, we hope to catch up again with you in, in the next months, and uh, we wish you good luck and good luck to the French presidency next year. <laughs> thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Au revoir. And I, I'm pleased now to, to welcome immediately uh, the, my next guest, uh, and I, I'm particularly pleased to, to welcome uh, Andrea Schwab, the, the MEP uh, who plays a key role in, in, in the whole legislative process on the DMA since he, he's the rapporteur of the proposal in the Internal Market Committee of the, of the European Parliament. Uh, guten Tag, Herr Schwab. Hi, welcome, bonjour. Thank you for, for joining this afternoon. We, my, my question to you, I'm afraid I'm not going to be very original, but uh, it's going to be very much the same as I, as I asked the minister just a few minutes ago, except that I'm talking to another institution now in, in this process. So if I may ask you, uh, Mr. Schwab, what are your views on, on the DMA proposal? And I don't know if you had a chance to look at the, the SER recommendations of January 21, and we would be very interested in knowing your reactions also on them. Please, sir. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much for inviting me to that very important meeting. I'm really glad that we have the possibility uh, to have that much outreach to citizens, to academics, uh, to um, parties that have a, a vested interest. Um, and as I have been listening to Cedric O, um, and I was very happy to hear what he said, I share his view. Um, first of all, we want this to be finalized under French presidency, and we welcome very much from the side of the parliament that very, very strong ambition, not only on content, but also uh, on the timeline. I mean, we have lost a lot of years. Uh, remember that in 2014, in November, uh, I was the co-author of a resolution of the European Parliament asking for the commission to act. Uh, on the search engine market, and uh, this is now nearly seven years old. So we have been waiting for long. So we have a pressure to act, but we have also um, uh, to make sure that what we do is in the end important enough to change things. Um, and therefore, I think the proposal of the European Commission from December was the best proposal that was available in December 2020. But now we have already seen new uh, developments, new ideas, new reflections, including the Sarah reflections that I welcome as well. Um, and I want to make sure in the parliament that we can uh, get a very inclusive uh, piece of legislation where all the committees that feel ownership on this uh, cultural committee, for example, not to mention the transport committee, but also industry and, uh, um, and uh, legal affairs, 
um, and, uh, and, and economic and monetary affairs, that you put that all together with a view of making the European digital single market the best of the world, the fairest of the world, but also the most innovative one and a market which is open to foreign investment. When, when, when you look at, uh, at, at the, uh, for instance, the, the core platform services and the criteria for, for gatekeeper designation, uh, do you think that this is over-inclusive, under-inclusive, or are the eight uh, core services and criteria are, are the right one? Do you think you, you may have an agreement on the, from, from, from the parliament on those? Well, in the end, you will always have an agreement in the parliament. The question is, what is the aim of this law? And I believe that in the parliament, there is a very clear aim of making Europe a very innovative place and therefore focusing this law on those companies that should really be in the focus. And these are the biggest com companies of the digital market. It's not some companies and not some uh, companies that are analog and digital. No, it's the biggest companies of the digital market. And uh, therefore, I think the threshold should be higher. I think there should be a very clear focus to avoid bureaucracy on all the others. It's true that there are some vested interests in uh, holiday booking, in uh, train uh, and, and, and airlines, and that we have to consider. But in the end, we have to have a very clear focus to avoid too much bureaucracy. On the gatekeeper designation, um, I think the process should be sped up. It's too slow like that. Um, and I think the exchanges in Article 7, where the Commission has to go for the dialogue, should be a, a much more um, a toothful instrument where the Commission is tough and has powers to call uh, um, uh, with investigative tools uh, the platforms uh, to come to a table at the gatekeepers and not just starting to sit together. So I think there we have to sharpen the process a bit. Um, but the gatekeeper designation is the key and it has to be fast. And I tell you very honestly, a gatekeeper doesn't fall from heaven. You know normally very early if you do a merger that you will be then a gatekeeper afterwards, or you know it already now that you will be one. And if companies have doubts, they can call me, I will tell them. When you argue for, for, for sharpening the, the, the tools and, and, and sharpening the teeth of the, of the regulations, are you uh, referring also to the obligations which are for the moment mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the proposal? Uh, because some people say that, you know, it should be much more flexible than what is in the proposal. Are you of the opposite view? No, I think um, the key question, Bruno, is how to get things done in the best manner for the single market to achieve contestability uh, of the markets again and to bring in like that more innovation again. Because with, with killer acquisitions, a part of innovation that was possible, that would have been possible, has been lost. So these clear rules are a very important element of making clear what we want to achieve. Because if you speak about fairness of markets, everyone would say yes, but no one would understand the same thing. So we have to clarify what fairness of markets in digital terms means. And for that, Article 5 and 6 are very good uh, baselines to understand what is fair and what is transparent and what is inclusive. However, in specific cases, I think that we need also a general clause about fairness because there can be developments that make us believe and understand that all these criteria for a specific case are not applicable, but we still believe that it's an unfair treatment what is happening there. And for that reason, we need the authority, the European Commission, to have the power to have a general clause to apply it, or even to make exceptions to the cases that are mentioned so far, because there can be situations where self-privileging can, for a certain time, be an element to achieve, again, a higher contestability of markets. There can be situations of a specific nature that we cannot foresee. And therefore, I think the, the robust proposal of the commission is the best start, but uh, a flexibility for that authority that applies these rules will be needed to achieve the best outcome for the digital single market. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, let's talk about enforcement. Uh, and and uh, we, we talked already with the minister about the tension which may exist between what I understand is being called for for the moment, which is a centralized enforcement at the commission. And at the same time, when you talk to, to, to some uh, regulators, national regulators, they say, no, we, you know, the, the national authorities should be more, should be more involved. How, how do you see things in, in, in terms of your objectives of making the whole system 
the most efficient? Well, I mean, uh, the European single market and also the digital European single market is one market. So you can, cannot have 27 different uh, uh, gatekeeper definitions and 27 different authorities that, that nominate uh, an awful lot of different gatekeepers. If you are a gatekeeper, you are a gatekeeper for the whole of Europe, finished. Oh. And that cannot be delegated to the, to the authority of member state X or Z. This has to be a, a common designation. But obviously, this common designation will very often start maybe uh, with the study of the Irish uh, competition authority. It may continue that the Hungarian member of Berek comes to the conclusion that specific conditions have proven them that there is a misuse. And it may well be that the, the German and the French are arguing that there should be a case and they investigate. And in the end, the European Commission just has to pick over uh, the documents and assign them uh, and designate the gatekeeper. But it can also be. Um, that a big company comes to Brussels saying we are a gatekeeper, we would like as quickly as possible know what we are allowed to do and what we are not allowed to do so that our um, uh, compliance regime works well. Therefore, I think we should not so much discuss uh, between the authorities, between the member states. In the end, what we want to achieve is the same thing, having an open, innovative and fair digital single market. And that can we can only achieve together. We, we continue this conversation with... Uh... The Rapporteur Schwab at the European Parliament. I just want to remind people that they, the viewers, that they can ask questions on, on Slido using the hashtag SERDMA. Uh, um, and uh, but let's continue. I, I got one question for you, uh, Andreas. The, 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 somebody is asking, how do you compare what's being done here for the moment with what's happening on the, in the United States? How do you see the, the developments on both sides of the pond? I think that um, the Americans have uh, been at the very beginning of this debate. I remember very well 2014 when some senators have complained about me uh, with Mr. Weber and others, our group leader, how, how dangerous uh, we are. And they have understood that this uh, is the right way to go. They are now um, very outspoken. I have just read the book of a, of a congressman who has been speaking about the tyranny of big tech. I would never speak about tyranny because we are a democratic uh, institution. We have democracies as members in the European Union. We are a democracy and there is no tyranny. The question is only how are our laws applicable? What do we do to improve them? And we are working hard now to make them as fair as possible. There is no tyranny. Um, but um, the Americans have now in the last years sped up immediate, uh, a, a lot and immediately, uh, especially also after uh, the election of Donald Trump, also under Donald Trump, there was already a clear uh, rebringing into balance of analog and uh, digital services in the DOC. And we see now that with Biden, this continues. Ciclini and others are working hard uh, to push the government to come up with, uh, with uh, stronger sanctions and a better regime. And I hope that we can work together across the Atlantic because in the end, at the moment, most of the companies come from the US, but in the future, they may come from Europe, from China, from Russia, or from Brazil. And we need a European, a worldwide approach for fairness in these markets, because we have seen it in digital taxation, where I've just done a report for the European Parliament. We need the Americans, we need the G20, we need the OECD, because on this, we are at the end all together. We are all users, we are all citizens, and we all need the taxation um, to be fair and the markets as well. Okay. Um... How do you see the work going on further in, in, in the parliament now? Uh, uh, you are uh, the rapporteur of the main committee, which is in charge of internal market. Some colleagues are, uh, from other committees are also working on, on this. Um, how, 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 do you, how do you see the points where, where, where the parliament will want uh, the, 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 to improve the proposals? And, and perhaps also, do you see clear divergences or convergences between groups? I think I see very clear convergences. I see that there is a very strong um, commitment to make this uh, law applicable as soon as possible. I see a very clear commitment of all groups to avoid too much bureaucracy, to focus it on the bigger ones. Um, it's true that there are some specific proposals. I saw it in the transport sector where there is already an opinion on the table. I spoke to my colleague from the industry committee. There are for sure some sensitivities uh, that have to be satisfied, but I see it as an e extremely um, 
um, interesting and uh, exciting process to be able to work together with all these marvelous colleagues that all want to make uh, their input. And it's my ultimate goal to make possible that they all can make their input and to make sure that the European Parliament can vote with a large majority uh, on that law, as we have done, by the way, uh, on the digital taxation proposal, which was only a resolution and only initiative report, so no legislation. But we have also adopted that with a, with a really, really big majority of more than 80%. And if we could achieve that on the DMA as well would be my ultimate goal. We, we have a number of questions uh, coming in now. Uh, uh, one, somebody is asking uh, uh, if there is one thing that Mr. Schwab would want to change about the DMA, what would it be? If I, can you please um, repeat the question? What would it be? I haven't understood. If, if, there, if there is one thing about the, the, the proposals of the commission on the DMA that you would like to change, what would it be? Well, there is plenty. So I don't want to bother the, the person that has asked, but I think the, the tool in article 17 takes far too long and is far too complicated. I mean, we want, as I told you, open and innovative markets uh, and not too much bureaucracy. But if the authority, after all the experiences that we had with the cases in the past, has to act, this authority has to act immediately and not only after a two, two year study and, and so on and so forth, the decision has to be proportionate, it has to be checked in court, but there should be no suspensive effect and it should be applicable immediately. That I think is something where I have doubts because the proposal is too slow and too long. That's very clear. Now, somebody else is, is said, is, is referring to what you, you said about innovation and competition. Now, the, the question is how exactly will the DMA help small platforms? Or will it, small, will it help small platforms? Absolutely, it will make things much easier because if you are a small platform and you discover unfair behaviors, first of all, you can check what behaviors are allowed under the DMA and what behaviors are not allowed anymore. And if you discover that there might be a behavior which is a bit borderline, you can immediately call the regulator at national level or at European level and talk to him uh, about the problem. And the regulator can immediately take action and has not to wait in that ex post analysis of competition authorities that we have been seeing in the past for the breach to be done and to be redone and to be redone again, but it can act immediately. And for that reason, I think we need a tougher regime on Article 7, so that even in the talks with these operators, the Commission can say immediately, by tomorrow you bring us the algorithm, and if not, uh, you will get the first fine. Uh, and in the Article 17 procedure, also a tougher stance. If I may, I, I would like to ask you uh, a, a, perhaps a final question, uh, Andreas Schwab. What, what would be your measure of success of the DMA in five years from now? Well, that's a very uh, a speculative question. To be very honest, I mean, in Europe, we have marvelous engineers, we have great innovators, we have really top level SMEs in all countries. I was amazed from 2014 onwards, how many, for example, French and Spanish companies came to, to Brussels to explain their business model. And I think they all need a, a, a place to grow. And the European market is a place to grow. But we are not excluding anyone. So my dream would be that this law allows to generate also European gatekeepers and at the same time um, helping other gatekeepers that are already there to be even more innovative and better uh, for the users and for the citizens. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for having shared your, your views with us. Uh, we know that you have a very, a very tight schedule and you've you got a, a meeting starting in a few minutes. So. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you so much, Bruno. And uh, hope to, to continue the dialogue later in the process. Thank you Excellent. very much. And, and now I'm, bye-bye, uh, Andreas. Bye -bye. And now I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to, to give the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Lara Natale, Ser Tech Media and Telecom Director, who will introduce and, and moderate the next session. Lara, over to you. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Bruno, for the introduction and for what I thought were two fantastic and thought-provoking political interviews with two of the key DMA co-decision makers. 
Um, and thank you too for the introduction. I'm indeed Lara Nathalie and having facilitated the previous sessions within this event series, it's my great pleasure today to launch this distinguished panel of academics and practitioners that we have lined up for you. Um, as a reminder, we'll be cogitating on key learnings from the webinar series as a whole, from the remarks just made by Cédric O and Andrea Schwab, and uh, we'll be really looking more methodically at the so-called Brussels effect uh, of, of the DMA regulation on the table. As always in this series, we welcome a transatlantic voice to reflect the particular impact on the US, which, which Schwab mentioned also, um, it being the jurisdiction hosting many of the companies will be designated gatekeepers uh, under the DMA. And we're very grateful, therefore, to have Harry first. Harry is uh, NYU's Charles Denison Professor of Law. Among many distinguished previous roles, uh, Harry has served as the Chief of the Antitrust Bureau of the Office of the Attorney General of the State of New York. Also offering global perspectives of the debate, we warmly welcome Cristina Cafarra, Senior Consultant for Competition at Charles River Associates and expert in competition economics. We're very much uh, looking forward to hearing from you both. We have some 20-25 minutes for what promises to be a, a very lively and thorough discussion. Um, Harry, I'll come to you first. Thank you again for participating in our panel today and, and good morning to you in New York. Um, we've heard Harry from many academics throughout this event series on what the DMA will mean for the US, uh, economically, procedurally, judicially, diplomatically, reputationally. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, MEP Schwab told us how we need to cooperate with the US on, with, on these issues on the table. So um, my first question to kick off this panel would be, how does the US position itself globally uh, in light of the reaction to some of the innovations being addressed by, by European regulation? Um, if we think too of Schwab's comment uh, about the US approach under the Trump administration, what are your views on how the US is currently perceiving and considering the DMA almost five months since a formal proposal was published in Europe? So first of all, thanks to Sarah for the invitation. Uh, this is this is fascinating. The discussion has been fascinating. Um, I always I, I I love to hear Europeans talking about these European proposals that I sort of understand. Um, and um, I'm reminded as I'm listening of the what the role of the U.S. has been in terms of the DMA or the DMA's approach, and that's sort of as a bystander listening, and uh, plus. Um, as kids play in the sandbox, parallel play. Um, and um, so if the question is, how are we currently perceiving and considering the DMA? I have a quick answer. Um, we're not and not. So I think there's very little perception of the DMA uh, generally, um, except among a few people who pay close attention to European matters. Um, and I think they're in some deeper sense, very little consideration of the DMA's approach. So let me explain both. First of all, um, Senator Josh Hawley would certainly be glad for the shout out uh, from Alexander Schwab for his book. Um, but um, uh, I think it illustrates the complexity of taking on these major firms politically. Um, Senator Hawley um, speaks from, as I'm sure many of you know, from uh, Republican view and from the right on the Republican view. He had urged on what are now called the insurrectionists uh, at the Capitol. Um, on the other hand, he writes op-eds that sound much like Elizabeth Warren uh, and concerned about the political power um, of the big tech companies and how we, uh, we have to do something about them. Uh, what that something is, of course, is a great question. Um, and it's a question that I appreciate uh, seeing um, the European Union take on because it is a matter of considerable complexity uh, in many ways. Um, and um, so in some sense, I admire what's been done with the DMA and I can understand why it may not be um, on the top of the list of really deep study by a lot of Americans 
because it is 81 pages of dense, hard to understand um, language. It is written in English. I know it's written in English, um, or at least translated into English, but um, it, it takes some work to go through. And I think as I heard, this may all change or change to some significant degree. So the DMA itself, uh, maybe not so much. Uh, but the question, the deeper question of what the regulatory approach or what approach to take is something that has been in the public debate, of course, as you all know, uh, but from the US point of view, probably deeply in the public debate since 2017. When I say public debate, I mean um, out in public, not just among the people uh, who would call into this group, um, people versed in antitrust, but more generally, um, tech columnists in major papers, um, people in the Senate or the House who, are, who see this as an important political issue. So in, in a way that we haven't seen in the United States, um, I think probably since 1950, um, and then before that since 1914, this is part of the political debate. Um, and antitrust has sort of a trademark point of view or branding point of view. Well, antitrust is about breaking up big firms. So let's reach for antitrust. But of course, we all know there's a lot between reaching for it and actually doing something. Um, in the US, we have not yet reached for an approach that is regulatory in the way that the DMA is. Now, people like to talk about ex ante regulation. Whenever I hear Latin, I wanna just take it out of the sentence so it doesn't confuse us. It's regulation. This is a regulatory approach. It's not relying primarily on after the fact litigation. That doesn't condemn it, but it's not the approach that's been taken yet. So the approach that's been taken in the US, um, as I th think you, know, you will all know, um, has generally been litigation. And some of it, of course, quite recent. Um, three suits against Google, only one of which, well, one of which is filed by, is, comic, is filed by uh, the Justice Department and a group of states, and then two other state suits against Google, plus two suits against um, Facebook, uh, one filed by the Federal Trade Commission and the other filed by almost all the states, um, separate suits, separate complaints, um, raising some somewhat different issues. So as opposed to the, um, the effort to centralize things that I heard in the earlier discussion on the European level, um, our system is not quite so centralized and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that uh, a little more. So um, we've basically taken a litigation approach. Um, if the emphasis as um, Alexander Schwab said is on speed, Ain't nothing speedy about any of these things. So the Facebook case now has in a pretrial order set for trial in 2023. All right, <laughs> this, is, this is not going quickly. Google's not going quickly. Um, I'm sorry, it's the Google case that's set for 2023. Um, it, it, this is gonna take a time. But as I understand the DMA proposal, this also is gonna take time to implement. So be, by the time it is enacted and then put into place, and then how are companies going to react to it? Are they just going to say, oh, you know, cool, we'll do whatever you want, or are they going to fight it? Um, so we have a fight or capture question with all sorts of regulation. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think I want to turn it over to Christina. I don't want to take up all the time, and we don't have all that much time. So. Um, uh, I'll, I have more things to say, obviously, but um, I, I should turn it over to Christina uh, for her views. Sure. Um, Lara, do you want to pose a question or shall I just? No, I, I'd like to, Christina, if that's all right. I mean, I mean, firstly, I wanted to thank Harry, though, because um, I think it's amazing to get a century plus look back at the antitrust framework history in the US. And, and, and also, I think, for framing the discussion as we go on uh, in the next 20 or so minutes, you know, time is short for us as it is with getting the DMA complete of having listened to the politicians. But um, uh, so if I understood correctly, you're framing the US at the moment as being at a place of litigation. Uh, and Europe at a place of ex-ante regulation, i.e. regulation. 
Um, but I did also want to comment before Christina uh, begins her remarks that we, we, you mentioned it wasn't clear how much the DMA would change. And it's very important to appreciate we don't yet know what the final law will look like indeed. Um, personally, I think it's very important in these debates to acknowledge the co-decision process in Europe means a wide variety of outcomes. It could be tweaking, it could be fundamental changes, it could be blocking. All those options are on the table at this stage. Um, and Schwab referred to sharpening tools, Cedric O emphasized the ambition of the timeline. So that's where we're at. Um, Christina, sorry for the wait there, but your contributions to the debate around these flagship new pieces of legislation uh, really have been considerable, both uh, at many events uh, held within Europe and beyond and in writing. Uh, we, of course, noted your paper, a translation of the DMA, which you co-authored with Fiona Scott Morton, who also appeared at the series. And you've written about other regulatory models trending globally, such as the mandatory bargaining approach taken by the ACCC. Um, you wrote about this before it made worldwide headlines. I wanted to frame our, your opening remarks in that way, really. Um, how would you position the DMA within the context of other global initiatives? Thank you so much, Lara, and thank you to Bruno and Sari for this invitation. I um, am delighted to be here. I want to start with the obligatory disclosure for someone like me who works in the private sector. So I have, uh, as many of you know, worked adverse to Google on a number of matters. I've never worked for or against Facebook, I have uh, worked, uh, done some work for Amazon, for Apple, for Uber, for Microsoft, uh, and others. I've also assisted regulators. I work for the attorneys general uh, in uh, their Google investigations. So that out of the way, um, indeed, how to place the DMA into this global context? Uh, Harry has given us an interesting initial take on the US. The, the DMA is inevitably a groundbreaking piece of legislation, but it is also not the only kid in town. There is a groundswell of regulatory initiatives at various stages of progression around uh, the globe that re reflect a pretty received wisdom at this point that actually we cannot achieve everything we want to do through antitrust and we need complementary regulatory Activity. And in Europe in particular, we tell ourselves sort of reassuringly that, oh, that's our European tradition, right? We've always combined and complemented antitrust with regulation. We've done that in telecoms, we've done that in payment systems. It's what we do. Let's also be clear that to some extent, it is a symptom of a failure of uh, uh, antitrust or uh, a failure of antitrust to go as far as we'd like it to go. Um, failure to enforce in a timely, effective, and, and forceful manner. And I don't think I need to remind anyone of the history we have in Europe, of which certainly, uh, to some extent, we're proud. We've, we've done three big cases against Google, but the, 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 what is known is that these cases uh, took forever, the remedies were not effective, nothing has changed. We haven't been able to move the dial here. In, on Facebook, we have failed to stop like others. Uh, problematic mergers. We have cases that are now live uh, against Amazon and Apple, but they have taken a very long time to get here. And in typical fashion, it takes years to produce this big 300 page statement of objection that then requires months to reply to. It goes into a black hole and everything is kind of unclear and takes very long. So I think, uh, you know, Harry, Harry said, Litigation takes long, antitrust enforcement as we do it also takes very long, and we don't have very much to show, notwithstanding good intentions. So now we default to regulation and we say regulation is going to be reaching places antitrust can. And so we have this uh, set of rules that companies can conform to, and they don't hopefully require the big enforcement apparatus that you have in antitrust. Now we have a set of rules that have been uh, uh, identified as an initial proposal by the commission, we heard Andrea Schwab. Uh, they are objectively a set of fairly messy rules, again, with the best intention. There is a lot of expectation that going through the parliament, there will be uh, significant rationalization and uh, uh, a, 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 an effort to make them more implementable and operational and rational in some way. Um, and it is umbrella that we have of fairness and contestability, which are fundamental European principles. But 
Not everyone, notwithstanding the fact that there is a global recognition that we need to do something, and perhaps outside the United States, we need to do something more than antitrust. Not everyone is, of course, at the same place in the curve. Indeed, as, as Harris said, uh, the, the, we, we come at it with pretty different and uh, animating principles. I think in Europe, uh, we have a, what, what, what supports this is a fairly moderate view. Uh, we have, of course, sort of liberal notions of fairness and, and contestability, protecting, protecting competition, behavioral remedies, no structural remedies. Whereas in the US, I think the view is more fragmented. That is my perception. There is, on the one hand, a fairly a fairly progressive extreme view that basically is saying the animating principle of antitrust should be dispersion of economic power. We should act because big is bad. We should break them up. And then there is a more a, a range of more economic, a, a, a more moderate views that are sort of saying, wait a minute, it isn't quite as that. We need somehow to reinvigorate antitrust and effectively make it do what it is supposed to do. And, and, and regulation is still viewed with great suspicion. This is my clear impression because it is associated with some sort of common carrier type of philosophy. And generally the view is that regulation hasn't worked, doesn't work, is alien to that system. Now in Europe, and this is the interesting part, it's not just about you know, really the commission in the US. The dynamic is more com complex and more interesting because in Europe, what we have is multiple experimentation going on alongside the DMA. And I think, in fact, much of the impetus for what is uh, enforcement in digital is coming from the member states. Briefly, we have the edges of the EC now, the UK CMA, which is a leading agency. They've embraced the same idea that somehow you need to complement antitrust with regulation, but they're doing it their own way. They have a specialist agency, which is multifunctional. They have Ofcom, the data protector regulator, into it and they are already gearing up to do things, a very bespoke approach, platform by platform. We are gonna have a code of conduct. You Google, don't do this. You Facebook, don't do this. You Amazon, don't do this. And this is the UK pragmatic approach, if you like. Simultaneously, you have also the German uh, case, which is extremely interesting and it is happening within the EU. Many of the US know this very well, but Essentially, Germany has come up with its own piece of exempt regulation as part of the revised competition law, Article 19a, uh, essentially identifies a set of exempt rules that will be um, that will need to be essentially met, uh, uh, abided by um, uh, what, what will be identified as companies of paramount importance to the economy. So this is a parallel system, and in fact, I'm aware of a number of parties that are taking advantage of this and uh, filing complaints or so thinking of filing complaints simultaneously with the commission, but also with the German uh, uh, Bundeskartelamt and the 19A to try and make sure that they have some sort of coverage and com competition between regulators. And then, uh, uh, so th th this, is, this is interesting because you then have Australia at the same time uh, just to, to mention them, they are a particularly spirited and forward-looking agency. And as we know, they have not identified a similar umbrella type of law regulation, but they're proceeding through inquiries and identifying in each case, the famous digital platform inquiry and the app store inquiry, remedies that could be used in this case. What's interesting is that the three agencies I mentioned, the UK, the German authority and Australia have also banded together to make important statements just a couple of weeks ago about the need to power up merger enforcement, which is a gap in the DMA, we know why, but it is a gap, as well as the importance of data protection and privacy being integrated into, um, into competition assessment. So, um, you know, I think that to conclude, there is a kind of range of experiments that are going on. It isn't just about the US and Europe. Of course, the US is at a very different place in the curve. They have been uh, not enforcing for a very long time. And now there is a big the iceberg has moved. The transatlantic has moved. We are seeing, as Harry said, a number of enforcement of, of litigation actions in, uh, also by, by the DOJ and the FTC, the federal agencies. 
So that is interesting, but there is more than the US and Europe. There is a range of others. I won't mention China, India, Russia, or the developing countries, because again, they're part of this global uh, swell. Um, but, but, but this is something where certainly the, the DMA is leading in many ways, but it will be very interesting to see how it comes out the other end after the parliament chooses it through, uh, what survives, what rules are actually going to be there and whether it does succeed in doing what Andreas Schwab was saying. We need to somehow address the business model, not the odd form of behavior here and there. Let me, let me stop there. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you. Um, a reminder to viewers that you can ask questions to our speakers via the Slido under the hashtag CFDMA. Details should be appearing on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Um, thank you both for very interesting statements. I mean, I noticed fragmentation and decentralization were themes that came across in both your remarks, and you were referring to both the EU and the US. It's reminding me of an event that Sarah hosted in late 2020 where we had the Brussels Financial Times correspondent for competition, Javier Espinosa, who said that um, for Brussels to appear a global leader or be persuasive in the DMA space, that Europe would need to agree with itself on what it wants. And Christina, you said something very interesting there about different countries uh, banding together to make statements. So um, for both of you at this stage, I suppose the top line question has to be whether Brussels still is or can be a leader in this space you know do you see um really a ripple effect or brussels effect regardless of whether or not we'd call brussels a leader um we've already discussed a little the impact on the company's targeted and on enforcement but um if we think of the question uh, bruno asked the political interviewees um, about where we might be five years from now what's next essentially um, Harry, Christina, I don't, I don't know who among you would like to go. Harry, you go first. Well, um, the question of what the Brussels effect is sounds to me like so 20th century. Um, I, you know, I'd echo completely Christina's remarks that what we have actually is a deglobalized system. Uh, we have a lot of different players with different ideas. And frankly, the commission has been pushed by the member states, particularly by Germany. Um, and frankly, the Justice Department at times has been pushed by the states. Uh, and there's private action. So who's first in court against Apple and the App Store? Epic in a private case that's now on trial. Um, and you know, the commission's issuing a statement of objections. The Federal Trade Commission basically had this complaint in 2015 and did nothing about it. So this is another aspect of um, what Christina mentioned as bespoke antitrust. I love. It's the title of a paper I'm writing, so I love that title. Um, so um, I, I think I think that's the key, and the key is going to be part of it is power, of course, the extent to which Europe effectively exercises power over these um, global platforms, and that's a, a question that I think depends on technology and on each individual platform because they have different businesses. So that that's the first question. But the second is the power of the ideas. So we always talk about you know, states as um, laboratories to experiment, Christina mentioned it. So Justice Brandeis wrote that in 1932 in a dissenting opinion. That's the power of ideas. Now, if experiments are gonna be useful, people have to find out what the experiment is and how it did. And this is where we're, we're not doing this. So we, we need to have more ways to figure out how each of these proposals are faring um, not so they could be the same, but so that actually you could learn something from them uh, and be open to them and also to pay attention to impact of the proposals outside the proposers technical jurisdiction. So um, Christina mentioned developing countries, uh, which are dependent on these platforms uh, in many ways. Uh, they're, you know, they're used throughout Europe, throughout Africa, for example. Uh, but their competition commissions don't really have the power to exert um, against these platforms. So somehow they've got to, their interests have to be thought of. It's not just, you know, are we gonna make Europe the great national market? I heard a little bit of a different tone 
to that than talking about um, competition in a global sense uh, that we talk about it in markets and um, contestability and that sort of thing. So is there a Brussels effect? And by that, I think you mean uh, refer to also possibly to the famous Adam Bradford book about uh, effectively Brussels being a centerpiece, propagating ideas uh, of regulation around the world, exporting them to the broader world. I think in this particular space, the answer is a mixed bag, and I'm not so sure that we are thinking as Brussels being in the absolute lead. Um, I think that I see the benefit, and in fact, Thomas uh, Philippon at my event a few months ago was very emphatic about the benefit of experimentation and different approaches effectively uh, uh, coming together. And it's 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 certainly the case that the big agencies in Europe, the Germans, the French, uh, you know, and also the UK in their own way, do not want to see the initiative to the Commission as being the only. Uh, maître of these kind of uh, rules. So I think there will be experimentation in parallel. Um, I also think that in the US, I mean, echoing what Harris, Harris says, my impression is that Europe, until two years ago, the commission was possibly in a position of being regarded as uh, being uh, uh, further ahead. I think that with the events of the past 12 months in the US, all these other events, other uh, initiatives, mm, the, the, the shine has gone off a little bit because the, the position is, well, you, you know, you guys tried, but it didn't do very much end of the day. And we are just kind of going ahead, thank you very much. So, you know, your regulatory approach, we may not need it. Let's see what happens with these uh, litigations and, and um, approaches. So then the, the, the next question briefly is what impact it has, not just on regulators, but on the targets and on the broader sort of universe of the stakeholder. Um, and I think I mean, uh, inevitably there is concern that uh, you know, the rules as they are kind of at the moment formulated are not quite there, that they are vague, that they are not uh, sufficiently precise because the benefit of regulation is that it should tell the regulatee what to do when. And so I think there is a lot of work to be done by Andrea Schwab and his team to just turn this into something which has got the potential for being self-enforcing and recognizable. Because if you have a set of rules and you kind of have to scratch your head and say, is that me? I, I, I don't do that. It's not actually, I don't know. That doesn't kind of make you want to comply particularly well. And so of course there is a lot of lobbying as you'd expect from companies saying, oh, well, you know, designation, not me, not look, don't look at me, look at them. It's not my business, it's this other one. So there will be a lot of that going forward. Um, I, I, I think that that is, is, is worthwhile and we'll see what we get. I think I have a lot of uh, faith in Andrea Schwab and his group, uh, but there is a lot of work to be done. And I don't think at this point, Brussels is the leading light. Let's kind of broaden the horizon. There is a lot more out there. That matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christina and Harry. And um, the, the disadvantage, I suppose, of, of keeping the panel snappy, which I, I think has been great, is that um, unfortunately we had some great questions from viewers that we won't have the time to take. But I will just extremely briefly read out the sorts of questions in case at a future occasion or on social media you'd like to explore them. So viewers were asking about whether Comp, DG Comp could combine ex ante with the possibility of making use of tailored codes of conduct for gatekeepers, comparisons with the CMA and CAA approach, making the best of both worlds, EU, US, uh, views on the five rules applicable to emerging gatekeepers, appropriate measures for preventing tipping. So even though this is the concluding webinar in this particular event series, obviously Sarah can keep debating uh, these, these very important questions and we will do that uh, because we're also getting great questions from our participants. Thank you once again to Christine and Harry then uh, for lending us your time and expertise. I'm sure you'll agree this has been a lively session, very fitting wrap up to the rendezvous series. And I'd like now to give the floor to Alexandre Destael, 
who is CERF Academic Co-Director and who has been uh, leading the CERF work on these issues. Um, Alex, you'll do a substantive wrap up with reference to CERF work of, and, and the takeaways uh, from, from all the interventions we've heard today. Uh, thank you to all and, and ciao for now from me and over to Alex. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lara. Thank you very much to all and um, good afternoon or good morning. Um, so, yes, the task is to do a kind of, a, it's an hybrid task because I have to do a kind of a summary of different meetings, of these meetings and also our uh, ongoing thinking at there with, uh, with a fantastic team of um, academics that I would like to, uh, to thank um, here again because, uh, I mean, we have worked together really, really well. Um, what struck me and in this debate, but in also a um, different debate before, is the willingness of the politician to do something. I mean, there is a strong willingness to do something. And sometimes I ask myself why, because of course there is a lot of problem, but the, the, the thing have changed as it was explained uh, by Christina and Ari uh, just now, um, in two years, dramatically. And my, um, let's say, fundamental explanation of that is that there is a willingness, I think, from politicians and from society in general to take back control of the digital economy. I have the impression that there is a perception of we have lost a bit the control to uh, some big players and uh, uh, we, we want to take back control of that. So um, this is what Johnson was taking back control, what uh, we, we, in a more polite way, would say we want to uh, push for self-determination, but that's the same idea. Um, now, how to do that? And that's, of course, the, the, the big question. Um, the DMA is um, a proposal. And when I have listened to um, this debate and the previous debate, I think there are some issues to, to clarify. And that's the work uh, that we are doing at CERN and that um, the Parliament and the Council uh, needs to do. First, to clarify the objectives. I think um, our Dr. Schwab mentioned that, and, and rightfully. Um, the, the two objectives, the two main objectives beside the, the, the single market is to increase contestability and fairness. But what does it mean? You know, Is it contestability on the market of the platform, uh, in which sense you, you really want to support the competitors, or is it contestability on uh, associated market, in which sense you want to support the complementers of uh, the uh, big platform, but the complementer of today may be uh, the competitor of tomorrow. You know? But I think the, the text as it is now is not totally clear in which kind of uh, contestability it uh, want to push, maybe both. Um, fairness, same issue. I mean, you can have um, a sort of ex ante fairness, so inequality of chance, um, uh, uh, inequality of opportunity, or it can be an ex post fairness, a distributional issue, because we think that um, although um, the gatekeeper have created a lot of value, this value is not well shared. Uh, among um, the different players of, of the economy. And again, I mean, um, the, um, the text uh, as it is now is not totally clear on what it is, okay? So that's one thing. On the second thing, uh, gatekeeper, I think it's probably the clearest of all the issue. Um, everybody tends to agree that the law needs to be very focused, not Christina is right by saying, okay, there is the usual lobbying of, okay, each firm, the, the, the firm which are obviously in wants to have a larger scope, so they have a larger coalition against, and the firm who are not uh, clearly uh, in wants to be sure that they are out. So um, that's a usual game. Um, the thing is that gatekeeper is a new concept in EU law, and um, there is some criteria which are foreseen in the text, but maybe more clarity on how those criteria uh, will be used by the commission um, is, uh, is in need there. Then we have the issue of obligation. And here, I think we, we need to be clear of what's the trade-off uh, that needs to be arbitrated uh, by um, the policymaker here. On the one hand, we have the administrability of the system. So it needs to be sufficiently simple to be quick. And this is something on which uh, Schwab and the minister have insisted a lot, but it also needs to be effective. So we need to have the right obligation. And you know, my impression and, and the impression of uh, some of the colleagues at CERN is maybe um, the text as it is now tilt too much towards administrability or, or to be quick and not enough about effectiveness. No, we have, as Christina was mentioning, um, different approach and the UK is another approach which is probably uh, more towards effectiveness, but then the administrability may be more complicated. And so what maybe we need is something in between, you know, uh, the, 
TMA proposal as it is now and, and the UK um, proposal. Now, the, the pity, of course, is that the UK is not anymore in the negotiation, and so this push to be uh, uh, having something in between will probably not come from inside the Council, uh, but uh, it should it maybe uh, come from outside. Another thing which is important is um, the flexibility. So Bruno has asked this question to uh, the two uh, key policymakers, and both of them agree on uh, that we need more flexibility in the system, and that the flexibility, um, let's say, uh, rule that we have currently in the law, in the proposal, which is the market investigation, is probably not enough, and uh, I would tend to agree with them. And so I like the idea of Rapporteur Schwab, which is to say maybe we need more a general clause on what is prohibited, so not only this, those very precise uh, 18 commandments, but something a, more, a bit more general, but if we go along that line, I think then, which, which we should, I think, then uh, the right of explanation or, or justification of the gatekeeper should also uh, be um, increased. But so really, I think in a nutshell, we should find probably something between the DMA proposal and the UK, um, the UK CMA uh, ID. And then finally, on enforcement, here also we have a trade-off, which have, I think be super well illustrated by our two last speaker, between centralization which is useful given the scale of the problem, but on the other hand, also decentralization, which can be useful to experiment new approach and for its agility. And it's true that most of the um, big reform have come from you know, states uh, in the US and member states in the EU. And so uh, here again, maybe the, the, uh, the system is a bit too blunt with a, a centralization system and no role, very little role for national authorities and judges. And so the question is how we can benefit from their expertise uh, to do things better. So you see, at the end of the day, we think that, let's say that a number of fundamental debate maybe have, have not been discussed enough in the proposal. And they are added, they are added with uh, the uh, 18 commandment or 18 obligation. And what we want to discuss uh, um, in, in CER is um, what are those fundamentals and what are the trade-off behind? This is really uh, where we want to, to carry the discussion and on that basis come with some concrete suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Alexandre. Uh, you've, been, uh, you've been talking in your, in your CER capacity. Uh, I, I just want to, to uh, inform those who are not yet aware uh, that uh, I, I'm, I'm extremely pleased because my mandate as chair of the uh, EU online uh, platform economy uh, observatory uh, has come to an end and uh, you have been appointed uh, this week as, uh, as the new chair of, uh, of the expert group. So it's, uh, it's being kept in, uh, in, in it remaining in good hands, uh, in good hands. So, uh, I, I'd like to just one thing. Uh, we, we we are not a gatekeeper. Right? <laughs> I don't want to be that we are regulated then soon. I, I, I would like to to thank uh, everybody, uh, all the speakers for their participation to this very uh, you know very packed, but I think very intense uh, exchange that we had uh, in uh, in one hour and fifteen minutes. Uh, uh, the minister Cedric O. Uh, the rapporteur, uh, Andrea Schwab, uh, Christina Cafara, uh, Harry First, um, and, and my, my colleagues, uh, uh, Lara Natale and, and Alexandre Strel. Uh, this is certainly, as, as Lara said uh, rightly, not uh, the last event we'll run on the, on the DMA. You'll, you'll hear more fresh thinking on, on that in, in the weeks to come. And uh, uh, Alexandre also hinted at that. So, please sign up to the, to the SER newsletter for, for more info. Uh, and finally, all the DMA, DSA uh, 2021 events are available to replay on the SER YouTube channel in a playlist called SER DMA and DSA Rendezvous Series. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much for, uh, to the viewers. Take well care of you and take care of the others. Bye-bye.